Welcome to The Sewing Report. I'm Jen, and we've got a very special sewing chat. I have brought in a friend, Brenda Ratliff, with Pink Castle Fabrics and The Stitchery with me. We are doing a social distancing thing, so we're Skyping in. And if you're watching this in the future, like if it's 2029, we're shooting this in March of 2020, and it's a pretty wild time right now. Uh, we're being told to stay indoors. People are fighting over toilet paper. Brenda, first question I have for you, are you guys okay? And do you have toilet paper? I have plenty of toilet paper. Uh, I guess one of the bonuses of never having time to go out and shop is that I stock up on things. So I have just ordered like, I think I have like 25 rolls of toilet paper or something like that. So I'm good on the toilet paper and the tissues and we just bought half a cow. So I have beef <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> uh, I don't know about the staying indoors thing. I'm an extrovert, so uh, I'm going to have a hard time not socializing. So I'm going to have to start Skyping with people. <laughs> yes. Now this is something we can do. So the yes. reason I brought Brenda on today is because we've been friends for a while and we've had some really great conversations over Facebook Messenger. We've never met in person just about the business and what's going on. So Brenda has shared a lot recently and you can you tell first, tell me a little bit about your background in the sewing and quilting industry? Okay, so I started my business nine years ago, February. Um, so a little over nine years ago. Um, I had just gotten out of a business incubator in Detroit called Bizdom U, and I was working on a couple tech businesses in the business incubator, but I got pregnant. So I had a baby. Uh, long story short, I stayed home with my son. He had to have heart surgery when he was born. Um, so I couldn't go back to work and start a big business. So I started sewing. Uh, it was a good thing for me to do. I think it's a very, I always had a sewing machine around me, uh, but I really never got into quilting until my son was a baby. And so then I started quilting. And one of the things I really wanted to do was sew with more modern fabrics. I was reading a lot of blogs. That's how I taught myself to quilt. And everybody had these really pretty modern fabrics that I couldn't go to my local quilt shop and find. So here's me with my business skills. Uh, and I'm like, well, I'll just do this on the side for a little bit of extra money. And, you know, just to keep myself in fabric, right? I think a lot of people have that um, aspiration when they begin. And it kind of just blew up to something a lot bigger than that. So here we are. Now I have two retail locations and pinkcastlefabrics.com. Okay, so can you explain, uh, you know, the timeline, you know, as far as uh, when you opened Pink Castle Fabrics, started off online, when you opened your retail store, and kind of where that journey's taken you from, from you know, yeah. a few years ago till now, or well, nine years ago? We started, I started everything out of my basement, and the way I started was just small bits at a time. I had 600 extra dollars, and so I made a very small purchase. Um, I didn't... I didn't take a salary for the first five years of business. Everything that I made went right back into the business to grow. And that was kind of my, uh, it was one of my goals. Like, you know, I'm a bootstrapper kind of entrepreneur, so I don't believe in taking, you know, funding and things like that. But anyhow, which is very funny being in a business incubator, um, <laughs> basically pitching for funding, but I know how that works out too. So, um, it was probably about a year or two in when we got our first location. Where we're at now, we've been for about five and a half years. Um, and we were at that other location for a year. So it's probably about six and a half years ago is when we finally started moving out of the house. And the main reason we did was um, space. We needed more space because I was growing at a rapid pace and I was starting to have employees. And when you have employees, it's kind of difficult to have them like come into your house and like work out of your basement. Um, working from home is a little difficult. You, you know how that goes? Like you, the dishes or laundry, everything's there. And one of the things I was having a really hard time doing was separating work and home life. So I would be, you know, at dinner thinking about work. And then as soon as dinner was over, I could, I would go downstairs and like fill more orders or, or whatever needed to be done. Having that separation really did help me th focus it more as a business and ju not just like a, a home, a home business type thing. 
Let's talk yeah. about everything that's involved with uh, brick and mortar businesses versus online. There's a lot that goes into having a retail location, right? Yeah, it's it's a lot of work. And, and it's funny because, I, you know, I was in a business incubator and they teach you a lot of this stuff. And it's one thing to talk about like hiring employees and, and signing a lease and doing like an event, an outside event and all of these other things like insurances and things like that. But it's it's a lot of stuff to do. So uh, my boyfriend, Jason, had uh, quit his job as a developer. He was uh, he was working at a software company. He does uh, graphics as well as developing. And so he helped me do my website, which is really nice because, as you know, like website development costs a lot of money. So I was really lucky to have that uh, portion of my money being able to be done in house. I also have um, a background in programming and a programming degree as well. So um, it's it's very interesting to think about all of the different pieces parts. And I, when you when you move to a brick and mortar, the big thing that you have to deal with is making your whole space merchandisable. So when you're doing it with just you know like. I could have like laundry all over the floor and you'd never see it on this video. And that's kind of the same way it is, you know, with, you know, uh, doing a website, you only see what I'm showing you. If someone's coming on into your business, you have to have it merchandised a little bit different. So, um, that's something that's really, it was, it was a little bit harder for me. I'm definitely more into the tech space. So, um, that was a big challenge, making uh, a space that was saleable in person. Um, the other thing is employees. You have to have knowledgeable employees if you have a brick and mortar location. So um, when I can, when I do things just online, I can order someone to process orders. They don't have to know how to quilt. They just have to know math and how to, to cut a half yard of fabric and fold it up and put it into a package. Um, when you've got a brick and mortar, that person is going to be asked a lot of questions and not just about quilting. Someone's going to come in and they're going to want to make a dress. How many yards of fabric do I need to make this dress? Uh, you know, there's a question that, that I don't, I don't sew a lot of clothing. So it's something that I know now because I had to learn it, but, um, you you have a whole other knowledge base that you have to bring on as well to for the brick and mortar so <laughs> that was a big so let, challenge let's talk about the money aspect you said for the first five years you did not take a salary mm -hmm. so after that what you know you don't have to talk exact numbers yeah. but uh you said for quite for a few years the business did really well and you made uh, a pretty good amount of money from it right yeah and but you know my i took a modest salary you know um there was no six figures, like not even close to six figures, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in like the, if I, I feel like a lot of people think, and, and actually my son went to private school for a little while. I just put him in Montessori school. It was a huge sacrifice for our family because it cost, you know, $10,000 a year to send him to the school. Um, and I remember one time one of the moms coming over to me and she was really afraid that she was about to lose her job. And she's like, well, I'll just start a business just like you. Oh, and geez. I, and I was <laughs> like, like, no, man. I'm like, what business background do you have? And she's like, well, none, but you do it and you, you make a lot of money. And I was like, well, first of all, I don't know where you're getting that. Like, uh, I don't know, did you see the car I drive? You know, like it's, it's not yeah. uh, anything special, but you know, I, I like what I do and I like hard work. I like the, the, the whole challenge of being an entrepreneur. I have a much higher risk tolerance than other people. So I'm okay putting ideas out there and failing. Whereas if you are not used to something like that, or you're very risk adverse, or you don't, you, you want to turn off your work when you go home, then being an entrepreneur is just, it's not a, it's not a good option <laughs> for you. No. How, what year off the top of your head was the best as far as sales went or financially? Probably, it was probably, oh, that's a good question. It was probably like year five, six, and seven, maybe. Okay. The, the last two years have been really, this is when it has declined. What do you think is up with that with the past <laughs> few years? What, like, what kind of factors do you have any 
theories on why that is? I think it's a lot of different factors. I think one of the things is politics. People are paying a lot more attention to politics now than they were, you know, four years ago, um, three to four years ago. I think um, stash accumulation, you know, yeah. over the last nine years, that's a, I think the stash accumulation is probably the biggest thing is that um, we had this influx of modern quilters and they wanted to sew. So they were buying up stash because they just didn't have any. After you've sewn for years, you know, you I have a stash that's insanely big, you know, because I don't have time to sew. And your life changes, you know, every couple of years, something else happens in your life. You know, maybe you have a kid uh, that takes up a lot of your time. Maybe you change a job or have to get a job because the economy is not as good, whatever it is. And you've got this stash sitting there. So you can't keep buying at the same rate forever. And I see that a lot with customers. I'll have a customer and they'll be a great customer for, you know, maybe six months to a year and then drop off completely. And that's because they've finally gotten to the, to the saturation point with their stash. And I think that's one of the huge factors of it. Um, I had a customer ask me this. I think there's a lot more options out there. You know, mm -hmm. when I started my online shop, there weren't as many online shops. Um, it, there's very low barrier to entry. Like I started my business with $600. Like you can go to a lot of these different manufacturers. And if you have a business license, some will have a higher amount of money, like two to $3,000 mm -hmm. that you have to invest for your first initial purchase. But some it's only a hundred dollars or some there's no minimum purchase for your first order. Mm -hmm. And that allows more people to come in and then we have sites like etsy and amazon where you can have someone else develop your website yeah. you know we started on etsy because i like i said i was i was i thought it would just be something small and then the marketing you know one of my big things that i am good at is marketing so it grew quicker than i big qu quicker and bigger than i thought it was going to be yeah i i 100 percent agree with that because You'll buy when you're new, you get excited mm -hmm. and you buy all this fabric and then you buy all these patterns. And I, I've done this myself. I have so much fabric and so many patterns. I've maybe used 5% of my fabric in a very small per percentage of the sewing and quilting patterns I have. And I'm not buying any more because I just have more than I could use in a lifetime, which is insane. Um, yeah. Like, do you feel like this frenzy to buy the latest and greatest is kind of a double-edged sword for the industry? Because on the upside, it spurs more sales initially, but on, on the flip side, people have so much that they can't possibly ever use at all. Yeah, there's definitely too much, and there's going to be, especially now, um, there's going to be a big reduction in the amount of fabric stores, the fabric manufacturers mm -hmm. that we have. It's, it's cyclical. I've seen the way the market works, mm -hmm. you know, like we were in a downturn and, and then we're in an upturn and then we're in a downturn. Um, it, it, it is, it, I see a lot of the manufacturers and the designers, they're always talking about two to three collections on down the road, something that's not coming out for six more months. And I think that that's really hurting because that's not what's out in the stores. No. There's a couple of designers out there that are really conscientious about that. And, and they promote the things that are in, you know, Tula Pink is very good about this. She's always conscientious. Her mother owned a quilt shop. So she understands the industry a lot more than some other people do. So she's out there trying to promote the stuff that, we can actually sell. And then you got to think about the way the manufacturers work. A lot of them are only printing one time now. So they're yeah. putting out so many fabric collections, too many fabric collections, in fact, that they are not able to reprint. And people are like, I don't understand why they don't reprint. Well, first of all, none of this is made in America. You know, uh, mm -hmm. there's this, the American made solids is the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. That's actually, you know, made here in the United States. Um, so if I wanted to create a fabric collection, for example, I would have to order one to 3,000 yards per skew. And that is a lot of money. And then it has to slow boat its way over from South Korea or Japan, um, not a lot from China, that we have at the nicer quilt shops. But, you know, that takes two months to do that. So let's say you have a fabric collection. There's always going to be one print that sells out completely, 
even if you pre-sell everything, you have no idea what the, the what the masses are actually going to buy. Like you can try to predict it. And, and I've tried for years and I do a fairly good job at it, but there's always a wild card that if somebody's like, this is great. Um, and so to reorder that, you have to have a thousand yards. And if it's yeah. two months, three months down the road, people are on to the next thing. Yeah. And that's a pretty big bet gamble to make. It's a lot it, of money. And that's a lot of money to put up. So I can see why they don't. And, and the whole not reprinting fabric to me also kind of uh, evokes kind of a scarcity buy. You're like, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this fabric again. So I, I need to, if you like it, you need to buy it now. And so I think that kind of spurs a lot of the, you know, sales with the new collections, because if you really like a fabric, you don't know if you're going to be able to get it down the line. I, I tell people, if you like this, definitely buy as much as you think that you're going to yeah. use of it. But then that uh, it happens and you buy a bunch and then you either yeah. decide on something else. And now you have that in your stash for like, what if you bought it for a dress and now you don't want to make that dress and you decide that you have, what are you going to do with that three yards of fabric that you purchased? Uh, it's going to sit on your shelf and then your, maybe your significant other says you have too much stuff or you feel guilty. I, I have a lot of people that feel guilty themselves for per, over purchasing. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, it would be a lot better if fabric manufacturers put out less lines and promoted them more. Mm -hmm. So it, what I'm finding now, and I'm changing the way that I've been purchased purchasing over the last year, uh, when new collections were coming out, I was buying everything that they had in the whole collection. And I was buying a lot of collections and I was not doing a lot of repurchasing. Um, but what happens when you do that now, when you're marketing and the marketing takes a long time because it's visual, you have to take a really nice picture. You know, we have to edit the photo. You have to put it on a website. That all takes time. Now I can't reuse those pictures. So it's a one and done type of deal. Whereas in other industries, you can take a picture, you can market something and then you can reorder it. So yeah. that picture lasts a very long time. It, and it, it used to be that a lot of the manufacturers would reprint at least once. So that would last kind of two times. But at this point, there's very, very few people reordering fabric. So you buy, buy, buy a collection and I take a beautiful picture of it and then it's sold out in two hours. I'm done. That's it. And, yeah. and one of the biggest things that they promote is kits. And one, I don't see kits selling at all for the more modern crowd because they're, they want to make it their own. And that's great. And I appreciate that very much. But uh, when I bought the stitchery a year and a half ago, that's a very, it's a different market. It's a more traditional market and they're very kit oriented. So when I am, when I buy kits, I have to know six months ahead of town, how many kits I think that I'm going to sell and make a sample. And as you know, making a sample takes a long time. So I might have, you know, six or seven hours and X amount of money into a sample. And then someone comes in and buys an entire bolt of something that I can never get again. Yeah. And now that sample's garbage. I mean, not garbage because it's a, it's a, it's yeah, a but you're thing, missing, but you're missing one of the fabrics for the kit. So you're right. And typically the people who like kits want it to look exactly like the quilt that they see on the wall. Over the past, you know, nine years since you've been in this business, what are some of the bigger changes or shifts you've seen in it? Uh, the online game is a lot bigger now. Uh, the, the bigger shops got a lot bigger. Um, and, you know, like Missouri Star Quilt Company, for example, I've seen them grow exponentially into many retail locations, like, which is kind of crazy. Um, you know, and there's other bigger players on there too. Uh, one of the biggest things is Blueprint, which was Craftsy before. Um, that is a very corporate entity. Um, I believe they're owned by Time Warner Cable or Comcast. I think it's, two? yeah, it's like Comcast? NBC. It's like NBC something, something. Whichever one does the making yeah. it show. Um, I, I, 
was it NBC Universal? I think. I think so. But like, that's a huge, that's a huge deal. When you see companies that are big like that coming into a market that's a little bit more niche and buying into it, one, you know, there's money in the industry, or they think that there's money in the industry. Um, and two, that means that they're going to take a percentage of sales from yeah. all the people that are already doing the the things in the industry. Now we've seen quite a few sewing and quilting related businesses shutter in the past couple of years. Uh, AC Moore, uh, Hancock Fabrics. So those are larger, more corporate companies and a lot of local quilt shops going. So yeah. what do you like that doesn't do you think that that doesn't seem to bode well for the future, at least for the near future? It, it's going to have to change. The whole industry is going to have to change. Um, it's the big thing is the margin. You know, you if you're in business, you know, margin is everything. You know, I was listening to some podcast where the you know, the guy sells like planners and like an online course, you know, their profit margin is 85 to 95%. So they're, they're like physical costs and their overhead is like minuscule compared to, you know, like I'm buying fabric, you know, at $5 and 60 cents to uh, the most right now for just quilting cotton is 605 a yard and selling it for about $11 a yard. Now, the manufacturers want you to be selling that for $13.99 a yard, like between $12 and, and $14 a yard. But if I'm selling the exact same thing as a bigger company for $2 more a yard, where are you going to buy it? With online shopping, you get price matching. The fact that we're all buying the same things, you know, for me to go and I can go and manufacture my own fabric in Korea. I've looked into it and, you know, it's something that I would, you know, aspire to do. I've done fabric design for RJR for a while, but, um, the big thing about that is the investment, you know, you're spending 40 grand on a maybe. <laughs> and so, uh, it's, it's something that it's, you're not selling a unique uh, product. Mm -hmm. You have to just market it uh, more uniquely than someone else. What, in your opinion, what companies or brands are doing, are really killing it at the marketing game? Well, I do like Missouri Star Quilt Company's marketing. I think the fact that Jenny started out, Jenny Doan started out doing videos and YouTube videos, mm -hmm. I think is huge. I think that's one of the main reasons why they are doing so well right now. You know, I learned a lot of my quilting skills by watching YouTube videos like hers. Um, same with that quarter shop. I think that they're doing a good job, like yeah. going and putting out the patterns, like, you know, things that, um, that don't have overhead to them, but bring clout to their business. And, and the thing is, is that not every business can do that. One, tech. A lot of people don't know about the tech. You know, I know about the tech. I just don't have the time. I have four employees right now. You know, we're, we're down to a very small staff. So um, to be able to do that, you need to either have money to hire people, which is an investment, or you need to have time to do it yourself. So um, that is is something that didn't happen in the industry nine years ago as much. Um, that is happening a lot more now because of, I think, it working for people. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, I think just being able to buy in bulk. You know, if you're able to get the fabric at $1.50, $2 a yard cheaper than everybody else, then you can sell it at a slightly lower cost. But now you have maybe 50% margin in the product. Yeah. And with Jenny Doan and the Missouri Star, Star Quilt Company, I think one huge thing they've got going for them is that with physical businesses, I think you need to offer an in-store experience that someone can't get online. And they clearly do that with with their physical branch. It's a very Instagrammable place. It's a mm -hmm. destination. And they really do offer something where you need to go. Like, so everyone's going to, you know, that Magnolia Village down in Texas to see Chip and Joanna Gaines. Like, <laughs> oh, gosh. people, yeah, especially younger people, if you want to get the younger audience and you want to get them physically there, you need to give them something that they can post online whether it be a selfie wall, whether it be something that cool that they can take a photo with, 
or just be seen at or get an experience where they're like where they can tell their friends about. And I feel like a lot of quilt shops and sewing machine dealers don't they're not doing that. And a lot of business even about even beyond that. They're just not doing that. Well, and I think it's not even just the younger crowd because I see the older crowd wanting that too. You know, like I see, you know, people even in the 65 plus category that want to that experience, you know, like uh, they, they take the trek to Missouri Star Quilt Company because it's cool. And it's like they get yeah. their girlfriends together. You know, do you know how many people like we do big events and I get people coming in and they're not younger because they don't have the disposable income to come and pay $500 for a ticket to something like that. But you see people who's like, I have... So many of these women were telling me, you know, like, uh, my husband doesn't want to go out of the house and go on vacation, so I'm coming with my girlfriend, you know, or it's a girlfriend's trip, or it's mother coming with a daughter, and it's like their time together. So, you know, experiences, especially I think with the events, like, have been definitely a great driver and same thing with events like there when we started out doing events um probably like year two or three of the business and um it got so much bigger you know there was no quilt con when we started doing mm-hmm. stitch a lot um there weren't all of these other smaller retreats going around so i would have people coming from like brazil um, you know, all over the United Yeah, now there States. are so many, there's so many of those. You can those. go somewhere local yeah. so you don't have to pay the flight. So, uh, and it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. So, yeah. um, you know, we saw over the last couple of years decline in ticket sales to events because, and, and I think the big thing is traveling to an event that's closer to you is more cost effective than, tra- you know, going somewhere that's going to cost a lot of money. Absolutely. So we've been chatting and over the past year or so, you've had to make some pretty difficult decisions as a business owner. Um, are you able to get into some of those, <laughs> uh, those, uh, yeah. changes? And I know they've been really tough on you. And I know for any business owner, it's going to be very, yeah, you know, very tough to make those calls. I think, I think the biggest thing is my ego. Uh, <laughs> I'm an ego, I mean, uh, person, you know, uh, but I, I'm closing my, I closed the in-store portion of Pink Castle Fabrics over the last couple of months. And I just announced uh, a few months ago that I was closing the stitchery, which I only bought the stitchery, which is a, is a it was a traditional quilt shop slash Janome dealership, sewing machine dealership um, that was 20 minutes from Pink Castle. I was trying to expand in the in-store portion of my mm-hmm. site to try and help the, the, the online sales that were going down. Um, and I don't know that that was the best call. So instead of like keep keeping on uh, with all of that, we're just gonna close that portion of our business. Um, in-store is hard because you don't get as much money per, I don't know, a per marketing thing, Mm -hmm. you know, like I can put out a newsletter for Pink Castle and I could say like, go and buy this bundle. And then 55 people can go buy it in one day. If I put out something to local people, there's the, the pool is so much smaller to choose from. And the, the transaction time of of purchasing something online versus purchasing something in person Mm -hmm is very different. You know, like no one's coming in on, on the website chit chatting for 25 minutes, yeah. you know, with the employee that costs more, you know, like the, yeah. the, the in-store employee that knows all the stuff is costing me a lot more money than the online, uh, purchaser or, uh, employee that's just filling the order. So it's, it's very, it's very uncost effective yeah. and a big thing for in-store is to have you know, you've got a lot more overhead at that point because you've got a more visible space, which typically costs you more in rent. Um, employees, you have to have staff, whether or not you are busy. Yeah. You know, um, when you have employees, there are more taxes that come with employees. You mm-hmm. have to have unemployment taxes. So just just for the privilege of having an employee, I pay Uncle Sam. <laughs> wow. um, and sales tax. Now I've got sales tax that I have to pay to the state. And there's about 12 different taxes that I pay 
having a brick and mortar and online location and it having employees. And that just alone takes up a huge portion of an owner's time. It's just paying taxes and, and doing the books. And even if you have a bookkeeper, you know, we had a bookkeeper and an accountant. I, I do not at this point because, you know, we're paring down very much and I can do those things. So I am doing them at this point. Um, you know, we had a bookkeeper that embezzled money from our company. That was a huge hit to me. Um, it, but worse than the, the stealing of the money was she didn't pay my taxes for a year. Yeah, that's insane. When you told me, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, and that's someone you're supposed to be able to trust to do right. those things too. I am a very trusting person. And so right off the bat, you know, like you don't even realize like the emotional trauma that you go through because like it's a violation of your trust. It's like somebody would come into your house and steal your television. You know, um, it's a very violating thing. Um, but the state and federal government, they do not screw around. If you no. do not pay your taxes, the fines are insane insane. And then just, just getting it all situated back is a huge, a huge issue. Um, these are things that you don't think about when you are starting a business. Um, even if you take a business class in college or on, you know, online or whatever, you know, like you, you think you've got all of these things. If you have like just a podcast and, you know, you don't have any employees or things like that, or you're just a pattern designer, you know, you are only paying just the regular general yeah. taxes. Or like uh, what I do, it's a pretty simple, mm -hmm. it's a pretty simple model. Yeah, you know, it is. I, it, and and I don't okay. have a lot of the factors you do. It's And that's okay. And it's not, I'm not saying it's not doable. It's just a bigger, yeah. it's a bigger picture type thing where you've got a lot more going on. It's definitely something you should go in eyes wide open and not and try to have as much information as you can, because running a business is there's a lot to it. And it's really not for probably I would say probably most people should not own a business. <laughs> I, uh, I agree with that statement. Well, and you listen to Gary Vaynerchuk. He talks oh, yeah. a lot about how it's trendy right now to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, and I agree with that. You know, I get a, every once in a while, I'll get somebody who will email me or come up to me and they'll be like, hey, you run a business. Can you just teach me everything? Yeah, I'm no. Gonna, I'm gonna run. I had somebody email me just a few months ago, and they're like, "I love your shop. I'm gonna start one just like it." How do you do it? It's like, well, well, one, please don't copy <laughs> like, me. Like, well, one, like, uh, my knowledge is worth money. Why would you ask that yeah. for free? Um, also, you know, like, it, it, I, I don't know. I just, I feel. Like I would like to help people in in their small businesses, um, but it, there's a there's a way to ask and a way. Yeah, not. and the so thing here's what I don't understand, and I get that a lot too with uh, the YouTube yeah. stuff or with uh, my knowledge in media, is mm -hmm. I've I've even gotten quilt shops emailing me directly, asking to set up a call or something to talk about marketing. It is, and I'm like, hey, you know what? Like, you know, I'll answer individual questions, but they'll be asking me for help, and I'm like, hey, I really you know, don't, would not be able to do that for no compensation. And they're like, Oh, well, I was hoping you would do it for free. I'm like, why, why would I give you all of the knowledge I've gained over the past two decades for free when you want to use it to make money? Like right. it's one thing if someone's asking, you know, like a family friend or something, but right. when it's someone you don't know who owns a business, who's going to use your information to make money, I don't know why you wouldn't compensate that person for the information that they're giving you. It well, does not make any sense to it, me. It makes no sense. I mean, think about this. Like, would you expect an MBA for free? Yeah, no. No, you would no. not. You wouldn't you would go up to University of Michigan, which is, you know, in my backyard and say like, well, I think that uh, you could just tell me all this information, right? Knowledge yeah. is free. And, and it's, I don't think, I just don't think people, I don't think people realize that it's a rude thing to do. Yeah. Um, you know, and- It's totally rude. <laughs> it is very rude. Hey guys. If you want my business information, yeah. make it worth my while. And, and Gary says that kind of stuff a lot. Or I, you know, offer them something that's of equal value back. Like sure. other than say, hey, I'd like to trade services with you. You know, I know you have a lot of marketing background. I have, you know, I would develop a website for you for free or do something. But yes. come to the table with something you're offering them. You buying me a cup of coffee is not, 
in it's equal exchange of value. Two dollars, and I don't drink no. caffeine anymore. So, no. and I, it's... I've fallen for that a few times, and I don't, I do not do that anymore. I've done it, a, you know. But again, I'll, some of these folks, and some of these were fairly known brands as well mm-hmm. that wanted my knowledge, um, but they also would kind of, they would kind of lure me in by saying they had potential work for me, and then there was no work. So I've gone through that a few times because I do have a unique background for someone who's into sewing and quilting. Yes. So I want to take advantage of that, but I'm like, look, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not producing a video for you for a hundred bucks. Like it's, no. it's not, you know, well, and also you've dealt with some people recently. Um, like when you announced the, the stitchery news, you had someone who was just a downright jerk commenting. Yes. <laughs> I when I no tell, can you kind of tell people what happened without call it, without uh. dogs and um, I, I just could not believe someone would treat you that way after you make an announcement about closing down part of your business. Yeah, someone commented on the post to like, peace out. But oh like, it was God. like a meme type thing. Like, they were very excited that we were closing. You know, I may not be everybody's cup of tea. I definitely understand that. But um, it, there, I think, I think this is what, where the internet comes into play again and trolls. We all know about internet yeah. trolls and things like that. Um, people who would never say something to your face will say something online. And, you know, you cannot please 100% of your customers. It's not a possibility. I have tried for years because it took me a long time to grow a little bit of a thicker skin and it it still hurts. It still hurts every time, no matter what, um, when people are upset with you. And sometimes, you know, it's not your fault. It's just that they're not having a good day. Um, she just was not excited. She was just very excited that we're closing and made it very public. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and that's okay, I guess. Um, I, no, I take it back. It's not okay. It's not okay. No. Just keep it to yourself. Like, yeah. It's funny because these are the people, this is like, uh, you know, these are people that like were taught growing, growing up, like we've all been taught growing up. You know, if you don't have anything nice to say, just don't say anything at all. Um, but online, I guess you can say whatever the hell you want, you know, <laughs> um, these are exciting times. I know, right. In 2020, <laughs> what a, what a, what a time to be alive. Right. Well, and, and you have, you had a good point. Cause you kind of posted this personally about it on Facebook yeah. is that, um, these same people that are complaining that they don't want to shop online are yes. just endlessly complaining about shopping at a local quilt shop or shopping in retail. Like it just, if you, you don't like you're damned, if you do, you're damned, if you don't, but like yeah. you're complaining about stores, but then you're also complaining about Amazon. Right. Well, here's, here's what I need all consumers to understand. When you own a small business, you have to make choices and sacrifices. I love that you come in and give me your business advice. I'm kidding. I hate it. Uh, there's so many people who come people in. People come in and try to give you business advice. Do you know, it would be real good if you were to oh sell God. blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, yeah. you know, I have a limited budget and sometimes I have to pay my employees before I can buy new product. You know, that's, is what it is. I don't have, you know, amazon.com money where I can just try shit out all of the time. Or, you know, I, I can't take as many I yeah. don't have it. Or maybe what you're suggesting, I thought of five years ago and it doesn't work. Or maybe I just don't want to do the thing that you're suggesting to me and it's only important to you. But um, I, I feel like with a lot of customers now, especially with Amazon, they, they don't get their orders in a day or two days. You know, again, I have a staff of four people. If I have 100 orders, we cannot do 100 orders in a day. It's not possible. Um, I don't have this like reserve of people that I can just call up to come in and do that. I I have tried that with friends and it does not mix. You know, I've tried to trade when you get people in that are doing volunteer work, they're not workers. They're not doing a good job. And then you're, you're, things are taking twice as long. They're getting much more confusing. It's better just for them to like take an extra day. Um, 
small businesses didn't have this same issue nine years ago that they do now because Amazon is such a huge deal. There were a lot of people, I mean, not that Amazon wasn't around, it's just that there wasn't as many people in a certain age bracket using Amazon. It's like, it's kind of like Facebook. Like my mom wasn't on Facebook <laughs> nine years ago and now my grandmother's on Facebook. They shake it over 90, Facebook now. Yeah. Right. That's and it. Facebook is now for the older people. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the thing. It's and well, you know, and I'm on Facebook a lot more now than I was, you know, even just a few years ago. They come in cycles and then people will go somewhere else. It's just the way of the internet. Wait but, till they get on TikTok, Brenda. That's, oh, that's I can't figure that meal. crap out. I'm oh so old now. Oh my god. I, I am not a good dancer. Well, I am a good dancer, but how do you tape yourself? I I don't know. I, oh, so I've I've learned. So I I was with some younger people, and what they do <laughs> is you. There's a timer, so like you can hit the phone, uh -oh. and then it and then it'll start shooting ten seconds later to give you time <laughs> to like get position. Excellent. So they prop the phone up on something, you know, they'll be like, you know, <laughs> hit the timer and then get, you know, get into position and then start the dancing. Okay. I'm not a very good. I I've done a little bit of dancing on TikTok. I've also noticed the posts I've done with BTS K-pop music are doing very well. Excellent. So I think sometimes it's just picking trending songs or whatever. <laughs> I do like TikTok. I just think it's interesting how a platform will age up. So yes. like Facebook used to be just for, I remember when it was just for college kids. Right. And now it's, I have an 87 year old uh, grandmother as well on TikTok or not on Facebook. No, she's not on not TikTok. TikTok yet. <laughs> she loves, she loves Facebook. And now now it's all about posting your photos on Facebook so all your friends could see too. Right. So it's one of those things. Well, here's another thing I want to talk about too is that you see a lot of people railing for, you know, hey, don't shop corporate, shop at your local quilt shop, pay a little bit more. And while I think that's a good sentiment to support local small businesses, the reality is some people can't afford to do that. And some people like doing that does not trump the convenience. Yeah. Like if I have to drive, my closest quilt shop currently is at least a half an hour drive. And I hate to say this, you know, please don't, you know, don't, don't sacrifice me local quilt shops, but uh, one, they don't always have what I'm looking for. The prices are higher and I have to drive in half an hour to get there. They're not giving me a lot of reasons to patronize the local quilt shops. And I hate to say that, but that's the truth. And a lot of people don't have the luxury of paying a dollar or two more per yard for fabric if they want to buy it. Some people are using upcycled stuff from thrift shops because they, you know, don't have the money to buy $10 quilting cotton. So I think sometimes saying stuff like that, again, it sounds nice. It sounds like it makes you feel good, but the reality is a lot different than what you're trying to preach to people. Well, and I think there's going to be people in every category all the time. There's always going to be people that have more money than other people because it's just the way of the world. But, you know, and, and, and I'm not looking down upon people who do upcycling or anything like that because, you know, that's, that's your craft. It makes yeah. you happy. Do what you want to do. Um, you'll probably need thread. Hopefully you buy it from me. You know, maybe you need batting. Maybe you buy it from me. And, and I think you're right. Uh, I think one of the other thing is there's a lot more choices now than there was. So it used to be you could go to a quilt shop and it would pretty much be the same thing at every quilt shop. You just go to your local one and they would teach you and they and they would help you with those types of things. Um, whereas now I cannot buy all of the fabric. One, I don't like it all, you know, and two, it, it just would cost too much money and some of it would never sell for me. So um, you have to pick and choose. And when you go online, the whole world is right there waiting for you. And, and I am a huge online shopper because I'm a busy person. I spend uh, like 60 hours plus working per week. I have yeah. a 10 year old son and I'm supposed to cook all the meals and clean all the things. I mean, not that Jason doesn't help because he absolutely does, but he works a full-time job as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, the sacrifices have to be made. You know, the reason I have toilet paper right now is because I bought it on Amazon. You didn't have to fight someone for it. I did Amazon. not have Jeez, to fight Brenda. anybody for my I mean, toilet paper. Jeez. The stuff, I the cell phone video of store brawls is just. It's like it, Black Friday. I'm like, wow. Quilt shops in general and sewing and quilting related businesses. Do you feel like a lot of them in your, do you get the vibe that a lot of them are struggling financially? So I think a lot of people 
think that you make a lot more money in this industry than you do. It's um, it's a big thing with social media, as you know, like when, when we have bad days, we don't post it. Like I don't post like, this is the worst month that I've ever had in business on Instagram because it's not a happy thing. Most people will, will post only the things that look good mm-hmm. to them. Um, and so people just automatically assume that you are rich or that you make a ton of sales or that you make a ton of money. Um, And that's not the case. And a lot of the people who do things in this industry do it because they enjoy it or it's like a hobby turned business. You've all, we've all, every one of us who has made something has shown it to someone and they go, you could sell that on it. And you're like, and you just laugh. Like like how many people, how many people go around saying, well, you could have a YouTube channel and be a millionaire. Party, har, har. Like, how hard is it to be a millionaire on YouTube? Like, you might have one video where you get kicked in the balls and everybody watches it and you make some money, but, like, it's not, it's a flash in the pan. It's, it's not one a- of those things where it certainly does not happen overnight. Like, with your business, it takes a few years to get it's to the point where you're period. making making any sort of income. And, and with that, you see a lot of the people who do make money in the industry had some other source of income yeah. in the background. Either they had a significant other that paid the bills while their business was ramping up, or they just had another that was their side hustle and they had another job. You know, I've seen people who are like, well, I'm a dental hygienist as my day job, but I'm going to have a quilt shop as my second business. That's not going to work. If you want to have a business succeed, it has to be your full-time gig. You you need a cushion to fall back on. You know, like I just happen to be okay not having as much as other people yeah. for, you know, I'm okay. Like, you know, I don't need a $10,000 handbag to make myself feel good. So um, it's different for me. And, and I enjoy the journey of building a business, you know, um, so a lot of people do not, you know, it's a struggle. You know, if you're an owner, like I know people who have had a business, like I had a quilt shop and it was like a part-time gig for them. And they had employees that stole, they had, you know, yeah. they did not have success. Yeah. Hiring good employees is extremely underrated. It is. Like, it's really, it's, it's really difficult. difficult. You know, when you get a good employee, like um, one of my favorite employees just, you know, got another job recently and it was very hard on me. She'd worked for me for a long time and we were very close and it was like my little sister going away, you know, like it was hard to let that person move on. Um, and not that I'm not, unha- I'm, I'm not mad at all, but it's just, it's just, but it is, yeah. It and is. you know, it's going to be difficult to replace that person with someone. And, and it is. And, and, and I'm not that I don't have other people that I could, that are good. It's just, it's not the same. Um, and that's always the way that it is, but that's how business works. And you have to be okay and comfortable with that. But then there was a time where I was having a very hard time uh, getting any good employees, you know, like we went through a big run where just like, sometimes the pickings are slim. What are you going to do about it? You have to get people out as quickly as you get them in. Training takes a long time. And then during that whole period, you're supposed to continue on doing all the marketing that you were doing, doing all of the the same business. You know, you want to make sure that everybody is, is on the same page. And then you have this whole brand new dynamic in your business. You know, um, things are going to be changing a lot with the COVID-19. Like, Anybody who's struggling at this point, is, it's it's just going to be like it's just going to be an accelerated. Like yeah. even with restaurants, it, like if you were having trouble before, it's going to make it make a lot it more worse. apparent. Kind of like when the tide goes out, you can tell who's skinny dipping. That sort of saying. <laughs> like if your business is not very financially secure, it's going to be very evident very quickly. It's it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, next yeah. couple of years. You know. Um, in, in business, there's always cyclical things that happen, and, and this is going to really bring the industry to a halt. Um, manufacturers are going to have to change. You know, um, quilt market is going to have to change. Um, there's the way that like you were tra- we were talking about the experience on the in on the, in the shop is going to have to change. Like people in shops and classes are competing with more professional people that do videos online and we're all going to get to know video here in the next couple of months. So people who may not 
be interested in taking video courses are going to try it out because of necessity. Yeah, because they have to. So what overall do you feel like the sewing and quilting industry, what do you think they could be doing better as far as attracting new new sewists to do quilters? I think just paying attention to where people are at in their sewing journey is a huge thing. Um, You know, some of the things that people think about in other industries, like, you know, customer avatars or things like that, like it's not a thing that's talked about a lot in the, in the sewing industry, even the people who are like educating the shop owners, you know, don't talk about that kind of stuff or they're regurgitating something that's like 40 years old, you know, um, a lot of the same things that worked in the 1980s don't work anymore. No, certainly and not. You, you, you're going to see, you know, sewing machine dealerships are a big, a big thing, you know, and a lot of times they're passed on, you know, how many times have you, have you seen a sewing machine dealership out there or a quilt shop that was like been there since 1980 yeah. something or been there, you know, two, three generations. Like a lot of the generations now aren't interested in taking and- over. And when I ask people in their 20s and 30s, and I have about sewing machines, their perception of sewing machines is vastly different from the reality. Like they think a $200 sewing machine is really expensive. And they also don't understand that they think that all of the sewing machines that exist are the ones at Walmart or Joanne Fabrics. Right. They don't, they don't even realize, they don't even know what like Bernina is. They don't, they really have no idea the high end sewing machine market exists. And that's no. a pro. That's a problem. It is. It's well, and that's and the sewing machine manufacturers are going to have to think differently. You know, in the sixty-five plus age group, you get people. So, so let's. I sell Janome sewing machines, and they're very similar to a lot of other brands out there. You know, our high-end machine costs twelve thousand dollars, and that's not a long arm. Those, are, you know, those are twenty-one thousand dollars. Like, that is like a car. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, so if you are, how trying, many rolls of toilet paper would you need to buy one of those? One. No, I'm just kidding. Um, one during the COVID-19 crisis of 2020. Um, but if you think about the, the, the income of people that are starting out of sewing and the way, way people kind of understand that. And, and so I don't, think you should go buy a machine at a big box store because I I know the quality of the machines that are put in. You can get one and you can use it. And if you have one, whatever, you're better off going to the thrift store and getting a mechanical machine and getting it fixed up, you know, than you are buying a, you know, $100 piece of garbage machine at a big box store. But because that's the way we all shop now. So like with with the sewing machine dealerships, there's machines that you can sell online and machines that you cannot sell online. So they want you to come in and see me because I'm going to give you the most information about their product. However, you can't just neglect the fact that half of the world's population buys something online or learns about something online or talks about something or sharing, like going viral on a post and then everybody talks about it, you know, like, um, what's the guy from Mythbusters? He talked about like, you know, going out and searching and buying sewing machine, you know, Mythbusters, you know, he's got money. He could buy a $10,000 sewing machine. He bought a Janome 3000, you know, HD 3000. It's an excellent sewing machine. It's around like 600 bucks. And whenever I see a video with a YouTuber who learns to sew, they always go to like Joanne's and get like a hundred dollar singer or something. They're never spending a lot of money on the machines. Well, and I think that's the thing is like when you're starting a new hobby, you don't know how into it you're going to be. If you're starting to knit, what's the cost of knitting needles? Like $12. Pretty maybe. low. And so the, the cost of entering that craft is very low. Um, even if you bought really nice yarn and really nice needles, you could start for under a hundred dollars. Um, if you wanted to start sewing and you didn't have access to a sewing machine, although our local libraries purchase sewing machines from us so you can go rent a sewing machine and try it out i always tell people when they come into the shop um if you want to try this out and you're not sure buy 25 dollars worth of fabric and go borrow a sewing machine or borrow one from your grandmother or borrow one from somebody else 
To play devil, a little devil's advocate here, I am doing a Learn to Sew in 2020 mm -hmm. series here on the channel. Yeah. And I am using a very budget entry level brother machine that I got off of Amazon. And I know some people will be like, eh, you know, but the re so the reason I'm doing it is one, because it's a very widely available machine. And I know that a lot of people who are kind of mildly interested in sewing, I know they're not going to go to a sewing machine dealer. I know they're probably just going to get something off of Amazon. So I wanted to use a machine that they would be more likely to buy. But my hopes with this is that at least that will get them interested in, in the door and make them future customers, possibly of higher end to mid range machines. Because I think a lot of people who are younger and don't have a lot of money, they see these sewing bloggers and sewing vloggers using $10,000 machines. And I think it seems very out of touch well, in my and opinion. Here's the thing is that, and I love the bloggers because it, it really does help the whole industry mm -hmm. and they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're not making, yeah. a, they're, they're not making a lot of money either. Right. Guys? Yeah. And I'm not selling fabric <laughs> or so, you right. know, I'm not directly selling these things either, but there, a lot of them are getting a machine from a manufacturer that they would never be able to afford on their own. You know, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing because influencers are a huge yeah. thing that is, 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 I don't think we, even the sewing world uses influencers the way that oh, they geez. should. Yeah. Not at all. I have a whole conversation that I could tell you about influencers. No, and I do not. Cons I consider myself more of a, I guess, a content creator. Yeah. You certainly more of that sense than an, an influencer. I really, yeah, I don't really like that term either. I think it's kind of it's it's a it's an interesting concept and yeah. i don't think i think that there there's a, there's benefits and there's takeaway or drawbacks to 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 all of this kind of stuff but you know um if you have a lot of money and you want a twelve thousand dollar sewing machine go get one good for you make money for that sewing machine dealer because that will put food on their take kids plates but you don't need one. You know, I personally, the machine that I have costs, you know, retail about $2,500. Like I did some research on an article that I never wrote um, about machines in the past. So like when people used to, they used to go door to door selling sewing machines. And like um, in the 1950s, Singer was one of the biggest companies out there. They're not the biggest sewing machine dealer uh, company in the world now. Um, they, you could buy like a 5.0 something machine and the equivalent price that you would pay in the 1950s to what it would cost now is about $2,500. So I think $2,500 is a good average price for a machine of somebody that wants to use it, you know, and hopefully you can use that machine for 10 plus years. Um, and especially if you're doing it, not just for mending and such, you know, like if you're mending and you're doing things for like that, you know, like probably a four or $500 machine will do you for a very, very long time. Um, you can get a one or $200 sewing machine, but they've got plastic gears on the inside of them. The metal is not the same. It is not the same. There's, there's a reason that some of these machines do cost so much yeah. money. Oh, certainly. Uh, and I guess my reason for using the budget one is that it's certainly more accessible to more people. And also because if I get five years out of that machine, I would be more than happy with it. And then I might get a nicer machine. Yeah. So I think, I think at this point, we just need to get people in, in the fold, you know, just get them interested, just get them, get them to want to learn to sew. And, and maybe we can try to expand our community a bit. Yeah. And I think, one of the things that people are not talking about is the like mental health benefits of sewing and quilting. Um, oh, it for is, sure. There are many studies that have shown, like especially when you get to a certain age in your life, you know, you stop learning. Being able to learn a new skill and a hobby will help keep your brain active. It will help keep you involved. Uh, you know, quilting, I very much enjoy. I have a very stressful life. You know, I have stressful personal life. I have a stressful work life. You know, some of that is like, it's exciting. And I like, I like having things going on in my life a lot of the time. Um, but it, it's a very good de-stress to sew. You can go and you can sit in your room and I will put on my Bluetooth headset and I will watch 
some show on Netflix that I don't have to pay full attention to and and just tune out and, and I and I'll do a lot of repetitious things so I'm not having to think about it you know I'll cut 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 and then I'll so 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 and then I'll put it all together um, even if you never finish a quilt project that's a very it's a very meditative process of creating and then think about this like it we live in a world where you will never reach inbox zero you know i know you, you get a zero inbox somebody sends you something and it's probably some garbage you know email about how all these corporate about, messages this week for <laughs> sure it's all of covid 19 about how they're going to keep we're you spraying safe it all down right? and also think about it too when we go into this you know new world civilization the, the skill of sewing will be very useful in the new barter society. Oh my God, if only. <laughs> when, well, when we have to, when we're making our own clothes and, you know. Think, think about that though. Think about making your own clothes and thinking about just, just the fact that uh, how many people out there don't know what goes into oh making Oh my gosh, clothing. 95% of everyone, when they're it, like, yeah. I saw this dress, can you make this for me for $20? No. Yeah, no, no, we can't, man. But and not just that, I think we as a society as a whole are very out of touch with how things are made. And that is a very difficult thing to appreciate. You know, I, I, I you know, you watch these documentaries and you in about like fast fashion and things like that, you know, you've got people in another country getting paid less than a working a living wage to make sure that your shirt that you buy at a big box store is a thing fit like nobody gives any craps about fit when no. you're buying something off the rack you know and tailoring matters you know we used to be able to tailor things to your body our weight didn't fluctuate as much you know and, and you know being able to fit things to your body is huge for making things look nice on every type of body. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what you, what size you are. If you've got a suit that fits you, you know, like I was just watching Tan France um, from Queer Eye. Is that the guy from Queer Eye? Okay. And I love him. I love that show. Um, he was talking about um, buying a suit off the rack versus buying a very expensive suit. You're better off buying a suit off the rack and getting it tailored. It doesn't matter. You can buy a $75 suit and get it tailored to your body, and it will look just as good as a $2,000 suit. And it's the same thing with clothing. Like, you know, you can go buy a dress and you could tailor it to your body and it's going to look better. It, depending on the, the depending on a lot of other factors, but like you yeah. know, you can find things very similar. Um, quality of material, you know, uh, what is the percentage of polyester in the the things that you're buying at a big box store? I have such a hard time finding 100% cotton. Yeah, anything. and and polyester fabric is so cheap, and it's not biodegradable. It's so it's it's not a high quality fabric. But I'll even see dresses online for 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I look at the materials. I'm like, why would I pay 200 bucks for a polyester dress? Well, I would and not. And that's something that you need to, that people don't know what to look for. You know, people don't know what rayon is made from. You know, rayon is not a man-made material. Yeah. You know, that is a, you know, it's an organic material. Like th there's a lot of fibers that we have now that we didn't used to have. Um, like you said, like things aren't biodegradable, but we're still doing it because it's cheap. Yeah. You know, people don't need as many outfits as they have. No, for sure. No. And like, look at the closet sizes. If you buy a new house, everything has a walk-in closet. Yeah. Um, you don't need that many clothes. Uh, I'm not saying if you want that many clothes that you shouldn't have it, you know, do whatever you want, you know, but just, just know what you're doing when you're doing that. Um, it's just like food. You're gonna, you're gonna see a lot more people having to learn how to cook. Because yeah, there's, I mean, it's scary how many people don't know how to cook. Mm -mm. And I'm like, I'm like, how would you even survive a day? Like, if you didn't have a restaurant delivery or McDonald's, would you be able to make it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I know I'm not saying you need to be a gourmet chef, but, it, or, you know, and here's the thing. I just want people to know where this comes from. Like, I want you to know the, like, if you're gifted a quilt, I want you to know what the work that was put into that 
means. You know, somebody spent days of their life thinking about you. Like that is special. That's yeah. a very special thing. You may not appreciate the like the color choices or whatever, but but just appreciate the fact that somebody cared multiple days enough to, to do something. Yeah, they didn't just you. pick you up a gift basket at, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond or, you know, right. whatever. So I don't yeah, it's really I don't know. Yeah, we we've got we've got problems, but I hope at least with everything happening, I really hope this is kind of a you know, g- gives people a little bit of pause to think about things. So maybe there'll be more appreciation for um, the work that goes into all of what we do, all of what people that are in, you know, that even think people like plumbers or electrician or garbage men, like there's a lot of, you know, if you don't have, it can be easy to distance yourself if you don't have like a physical job, you know, like a real labor intensive job, you know, but there's a lot, or my husband who works in restaurants, again, how does your food get to you, you know, and that sort of thing. So I mean, there's, there, you know, what this all, you know, with us being cooped up, I think there's some, obviously a lot of bad, but, mm-hmm. you know, maybe there is some, there's some a sort silver of lining here. Yeah. <laughs> some sort of perspective here to, to gain from it. So I do want to ask as a business owner um, over the past nine years, what are some of the, the biggest um, surprises that you, you know, or things you didn't realize when you got into it? What are some of the biggest uh, lessons you've learned or things you've had to, you know, figure out? Uh, employees was the biggest thing. Just like we were talking about before finding good employees. Like I never thought that it would be as difficult as it is to find a good fit for a position in your company. Um, and that is a huge thing. And, you know, um, just, when having to close a business, like when to close a business is something that they do not teach you. Um, you are taught, you know, in the business incubators and in the, um, the, the schools, like how to market, how to make sales, how to grow your business, but nobody tells you when it's time to stop. A lot of times they'll tell you when it's time to sell your business. Like if you get funding, it's like, I'm going to get funding. I'm going to have this thing for two years and then I'm going to, you know, sell it for a million dollars to Google, you know, good for you. Um, <laughs> take your chances. Maybe on. Amazon will start buying up all the quilt shops. Oh, uh, probably oh, not. Geez. But like, but they'll have to have a different model. And, you know, like think about it. There's no chain fabric stores except for Joann's and Michael's now. and Walmart yeah. and and Michael's really maybe. only sells fabric online and they like, and I don't then think they really have the store yeah they have fabric. tiny they have like they have like some pre-packs but they don't sell mm-hmm. they don't sell fabric by the yard at Michael's it, but so you have to think about like you know it's just, it's like it's like Chinese restaurants. Like, you know, there's no like chain of Chinese restaurants, even though they all sell the same thing, you know, it's, it's the same with quilt shops. Like there's this like network of quilt shops, but they're not the same. Um, nobody's got this good practice that they're doing and then giving the secrets to everybody. Um, one of the things I found in the industry that I didn't expect was the closed off manner that other quilt shop owners have um they don't want to tell you their secrets or share the things that work or don't work with other people a lot of the times um i hear a lot my quilt shop owner is grumpy like i now know exactly why your quilt shop is grumpy uh owner is grumpy but you know um it's it's isolating it's isolating to not be able to share um, entrepreneurship with someone else. So that's a big problem that I've had in, in my industry or just being an owner in general. Um, you know, I have lovely friends and I love them to death, but they have absolutely no idea what I go through, even if they are empathetic or will listen to my problems, but they don't, if what happens if I don't make enough money to pay my employees? That's a huge thing for me. Like that, especially when times are not good, you know, um, the, uh, the the stress that that your body takes on is something that is very um, detrimental to your health. Like I uh, I have anxiety, and it go it, it go, comes and goes. And but when I'm in stressful times, like it takes a physical toll on you. Um, Can you think of anything specific that you feel local quilt shops need to be doing? 
like right now to to survive? Is there anything that you think? I think banding together, like, you know, like telling, telling, working with each other, you know, not just with shop hops and things like that, Mm because I think the shop hop is not a good model anymore. It was a good thing before, but, you know, um, I will send people to the quilt shop down the road because I don't carry a lot of fatigue and they do, you know, but I don't have chit chats with the owner about what's doing well for her and what's not, you know, I think I talked to her once, like, you know, five, seven years ago, but I think that would be a huge benefit to the quilt shop. You know, one of the things that, that we could do as quilt shop owners is go in and purchase things together together yeah kind of almost like a co-op buy or mm-hmm. bulk discount and then split it up among everyone that's not something people yeah. are doing you Interesting. Know, like, uh but you know i i found that like trying to be friends with people that own quilt shops and i'm not saying all of them because there's a lot that are very lovely but a lot yeah. of the people that i that i talk to that are other quilt shop owners don't live anywhere near me and not to say that like we can't be friends it's just not a thing that happens you know yeah. um and that's a big, it's, that's something that you look in other industries, especially like agency work, you know, like, you know, web design and things like that. They're constantly giving people business and yeah. helping each other. Like, I can't deal with this client. Can you help them? Like, I don't have quilt shop owners calling me like, oh God, you know, I just don't have this fabric. Do you? Yeah. Whereas if you went to Nordstrom, they could easily look up what other Nordstrom has yeah. that get it to you and have it delivered straight to your home. So why wouldn't you go to Nordstrom? Yeah, yeah right? we've got the we've got the privilege of having all this technology and resources at our fingertips. Yeah, and people aren't using it to really want the, like we talked about the customer experience. People aren't using it to enhance the customer experience enough. There's not enough collaboration with other things. You know, there's not enough enough collaboration with designers and quilt shops. Um, a lot of fabric designers have absolutely no idea what happens with the fabric once they've designed it. And yeah. it's, I don't blame them. You don't make enough money to give a crap. <laughs> yeah. Are there any types of businesses in the sewing and quilting industry that you see doing well, like as far as business models go, or, you know, like the PDF pattern people, the indie sewing pattern companies, uh, what kind of, do you see any winners in the industry right now? I, I think I think people who put out good patterns, it, it's the low barrier to entry. You know, you can make a PDF if you know a little bit of InDesign or yeah. Illustrator um, or have enough money to go to Fiverr and pay someone to do it for you. But the quality of your work needs to come out and make it a longevity type thing. Like if you put out a pattern, that quilt shop owner like wants to use it over and over again. Yeah. The, one of the big things is kind of like a fight between a quilt shop owner and like an independent designer is that a lot of uh, pattern designers aren't printing. They're making the mm-hmm. PDFs and that is quilt shop owners aren't making that five bucks yeah. per pattern anymore. So um, that does hurt the local quilt yeah. shop, uh, their bottom line. And then on the flip side, I see people who are buying one of someone's patterns and then copying it. Now that pattern designer oh isn't getting the $5 yeah. for each and every pattern. There are ways for people to work together on that. And, you know, I, I don't see a lot of designers coming to me saying like, Hey, I'd love to, you know, create a pattern with you or, or for you, or what are your suggestions? Um, you know, I see the pattern designers who don't just rely on one line of fabric doing really yeah. well. You know, I was talking to one of my favorite pa- uh, pattern designers about a year or two ago, and we were talking about what sells and what doesn't sell in a quilt shop. The fact that she had the conversation yeah. with me as a quilt shop owner um, about what patterns sell and why, and then took my suggestions and then did it. And then she did follow back up with me. One, okay, I'm going to give you all this suggestion. Do not put one fabric line on the front of your pattern. Mm-hmm. As soon as that fabric collection goes out of style, yeah. your pattern needs a new cover. And if you're yeah. printing it, then you're spending a bazillion dollars on something that has- Or at least show it, show it with different fa- different types of fabric or different 
split it up, make it a, you know what, do, just make it a scrappy pattern, make yeah. it with scraps. That is something and people will then ask for the colors and not yeah. the fabric. And not that specific. No, that's true. Cause it seems mm -hmm. like they will put out cover pattern, you know, cover yes. pictures and people want to make it with that same fabric. And then you're right when it's gone. And as someone who buys patterns, uh, I'll be honest, I, PDF patterns is not my first choice unless, unless that's the only option. But if I can choose between a printed pattern and a PDF pattern, uh, uh if it's, especially if it's something larger, like clothing, mm -hmm. garments are I, always printed. I hate, I absolutely hate the print and tape the pieces together method. Yes, I know some of worst. you may not mind that. I personally hate it. And I've, I've recently been on this subreddit on Reddit called Craft Snark. Mm -hmm. There's actually some real interesting conversations going on there. And it's it's basically like they'll talk about what they think about the McCall Pattern Company's new website design. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, and a lot of them really, um, I've noticed some interesting trends. One, they think a lot of the indie pattern companies are, like you said, not very good quality or there's mm -hmm. some real flaws in like the fit of the clothing, especially with the clothing ones. Um, there's also talk about um, like why the price of the PDF patterns for indie companies. Some of them will charge $12, $15 for a simple dress when you can get a similar pattern from McCall's on sale for $199. So those people are just going to the big four and buying the pattern. And I'm kind of the mm -hmm. same way too. I like that with McCall's or the big four, if there's a sale, I can get multiples of it and not have to worry about like tracing it. I can just cut out the size I want and know that I have another copy that I can cut out another size or another style. Yeah. And because I just don't like, I don't like making more work for myself when it comes to sewing patterns. No. And so there's a lot of good indie pattern designers out there. There are a lot of people who uh, clothing patterns are very different than quilting patterns. Quilting patterns is math. It's yeah. just straight. Quilting patterns math. are a little easier. The clothing ones, there are. You need to grade it. Yeah, you need to grade it. With them. Um, and I think, you know, I don't, uh, there is, you can hire someone to do your grading when you're doing patterns for garments. You know, like I have friends who are very good at it and will help you with your patterns for money, not for free. Yeah, do not, not for, ask their yeah, advice don't for ask free. Don't ask people for free. But, um, you know, I think the indie patterns having to charge more be is because they have to go through all yeah. of that process. So when you get a good indie pattern company, you see that they have multiple patterns and you see people making that pattern over and over again. They're making it for a reason. But then on the other hand, there's some people who like just had like a, a pattern that worked for a minute and it was a flash in the pan. Some of them look good on people. Some of them do not look good on people. And I think some of the complaints are that they're charging so much money and then they're still not very good patterns. And I think that's, that's and I think that's a valid criticism. And also yes. the, the folks, and, and again, anyone in the industry, you should definitely check out the craft snark subreddit. There are some really, there's some very interesting conversations uh, going on in there. Um, you know, and the other thing is that, they there were some and I think this is interesting. They were talking about the retreats where they bring in like a celebrity. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people just a, a lot of the people in there, I think they skewed younger, but they felt like it was a little out of touch to charge like four five hundred to a thousand dollars when a lot of people can't afford that. So I thought that was an interesting well, critique of that that let's route. talk about that because i yeah. do i do charge five hundred dollars for uh, uh so, so yeah recipe, answer those people maybe treat. from the craft yeah store. i mean and, so and, and and if you think about this the thing that retreats are man you could go to low end to very high end on these things and i feel like i fall somewhere in between um just because someone is a celebrity doesn't mean that they're good at teaching. I'm going to just flat out tell you that over the nine years that I've been doing this and seven years doing events, the people who have the, the best draw may not be the ones that you have the best class with. Yeah. Maybe you can think about going to a smaller event that has a, a lower price tag or just trusting somebody, you know, who's done this for a few years, who's gotten somebody in that's doing a really good job teaching. Um, I think people get a little bit snobby about it, like a little bit like, yeah. you know, uh, and the complaint, I, I, I talk. But yeah. And with the celebrities, the complaint was more, not that it was so, not that it was expensive, but yeah. more that um, 
I guess they felt a little rubbed the wrong way by the fact that these businesses would think that someone would love to pay 500 bucks just to hobnob with so-and-so. And I think that's an interesting, again, critique. Because yeah. again, I don't care. Like if someone's a good teacher, you don't necessarily, like if you're there for the teaching, you won't really necessarily care who the instructors are, I guess. Right. But it, it is kind of, you know, it does seem sort of, you know, I think for some people, they just felt it was a little out of touch, I guess, with everyday it depends what you're doing. Life. So like we are the, the events that we do, especially when we do the hotel events, it costs a lot of yeah. money, you know, within a $500 ticket, I might have $350 of that in overhead. And, you know, uh, when I do the smaller events, like 30 people, my break even point was 24 tickets. Like that's yeah. like, it's, it's huge. Like the cost of food is, is huge. Yeah. enormous and then you know just having all of the people's different dietary needs is, is a logistical nightmare um you know i feel like that they're a very valuable thing and 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 events are a huge thing that i think people should do um but if, if 500 dollars the ticket's not your gig you know that's why yeah. guilds are around you know yeah i do think i would like to see some lower cost mm -hmm. you know personally i would love to see some and again, they don't, they're, they were not asking for celebrities to be there or any, but just more like getting together with people to do that. But also a lot of the folks in this subreddit are younger. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you go to these events and I've experienced this myself, um, when you do go to one of these events and you're clearly a much different age range than everyone else, you don't feel super comfortable there sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, like some of these people may treat you like you're a little kid. Like I've, you know, I've dealt with that personally. And that made me never go back to that uh, particular organization's <laughs> events because they just kind of made me feel so like, like they were my mom. And I'm like, look, when oh. I go to these events, I do not want people to treat me like I'm like they're my mother. I already have yeah. a mother. And like, and they weren't treating me as an adult. And that was very off-putting to me. I, I get, I get people who come into my shop uh, who are older than me, who are like, well, you have no idea because oh you're so God. young. And I'm like, hey, thank you so much because yeah. I am 41. I look gorgeous for 41. Um, but, you know, I do know more than you do. <laughs> you know? um, I do this, you know, over 10,000. I've done this over 10,000 hours. I'm a master at, at this type of thing. But, you know, it's, I think we need to be more encouraging when you see somebody who's yeah. especially younger or a beginner. I had somebody, um, it was a, a friend of a family friend messaged me on Facebook and they were like, you know, um, I'm going to have my first grandchild. And I was just thinking like, I might start sewing. Is that a rich, should I have been doing this for years? Like, no, yeah, no, start now. The best no. time is now. Who cares? Like, in fact, now you have more time, a reason to sew, you know, because you have a grandbaby on the way and you have more disposable income at this point in your life. You know, I think that I wouldn't ever, downplay somebody who's younger, like in their twenties, for example, that was interested in this. I get excited when it's, yeah. when I, I have seen some of my employees not get excited about this. I'm, I'm, I definitely can see where people are coming from, but like when you come into my shop and it is like, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done this before. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. One part of it too, is that I'm in a few sewing, I'm sure you're in a few sewing Facebook groups is the attitude when someone makes a post, maybe about their hundred dollar singer machine. And then a bunch of the other comments are saying that's a garbage machine. I feel like that's a really wrong approach to put to that yeah, person. Said that like, like just say, but at the same time to, yeah, someone, like, who, to someone who bought the hundred dollar sewing machine, right. that's it's, definitely the wrong thing to say to them that no, that machine is crap. And that, yeah, you're right. You and, encouraging and, instead of just being like, you know, that's a gar just that it's a throwaway machine, but to them that might've cost a lot of money for them. And I feel like that might potentially turn someone off. If you, yes. um, like I had a friend, um, she's about my age. So in her thirties and she wanted to buy a sewing machine. And I said, look, and, and that, that's a pet peeve, peeve of mine is the sewing machine snobs. Mm -hmm. I'm personally not loyal to any one brand. I've bought sewing machines of different brands. I think there are good things about even the lower price machines as well. Um, like I've had the brother CS 7,000i. I actually like sewing on that machine. It does not cost a lot of money. And if it lasts me five years, I'm going to be like, Hey, that's really great. I've had a, uh, an entry level serger for a few years. 
I don't see myself getting any, anything more expensive because I don't think I need it. But this woman was telling me, oh, sorry, that she was, she had been talking to this. It sounded like a woman who was older than her. And uh, this lady sold Viking machines. Mm -hmm. So my friend was trying to ask her about opinions. And she asked me and I said, look, I said, if someone's selling that brand, take what they say with the grain of salt and you should research different. You should definitely research multiple brands, try them out and see which one is for you. And I said, if that person gets pissy with you because you're not into that brand, don't buy from them. And she said, that's exactly what happened to her. She, she, and she ended up buying it. I think it was a Janome. She did not buy the Viking, um, but it was, and it wasn't necessarily because she didn't like Viking, but it was because that woman just started treating her very poorly when she expressed interest or curiosity in anything else. You're going to find within any brand of machines, good and bad. You know, mm -hmm. I love Janome machines. I think they do a very good job with the quality of their machines for the price of their machines. Yeah. And, and that is why I have these dealerships. So I am very passionate and I will tell you to buy a Janome machine. Um, but within the range of Janome, I do not carry every model. Yeah. Because I think that there are ones that I think are better value for you, um, that have better features. You know, there's some like, you know, you get some machines that the difference between the two is one has 40 more stitches than the other one. Like if you, you like, might not I, need all those. I've never once had any customer come in and be like, I need the machine with all of the stitches. Like nobody gives a crap about that you know throat space is the biggest thing you know does it sew through x amount of yeah. layers of and now people material. want heavy they really want, they want heavy, heavy duty, duty. Machines, yeah. and so viking is now owned by singer um so is faf you know it doesn't mean that they're all bad machines it's just that the, the, the sewing machine industry is getting smaller you know janome makes machines for other brands you know, it's a, it's a white label type thing. You know, it's just like your refrigerators and your cars and everything. It's like all made in the same factory and someone slaps a label on it. And now you've got a blah, blah, blah machine, you know, like ever sewn, you know, like those machines are made by other brands or, you know, or made with other things in mind, you know, like, um, so, you know, I think just not only knowing the brand, but knowing what within the brand works really well that's hard because there's so much out there. I can see very clearly why a beginner sewer is stalled at the beginning because there's too much choice. There's not a clear path of saying like, this is the beginner machine, yeah. this is the middle of the machine, and this is the to high end and machine. And it depends on what they want to sew. Like Absolutely. it really, and your what you want to sew <laughs> will change. You may start yes. off quilting and then you may realize you don't like quilting and you want to just do clothes. Well, and, and there's, I think, so for me, like I can really speak about Janome because I sell those machines. They have some machines that I think are good for a great all over machine at a decent mm -hmm. price. Like the Janome 3160 is around 650 bucks. It comes with a lot of feet. It comes with a table. It comes with a thread cutter. It comes with enough stitches to make garments. It comes with enough stitches and feet to make quilts. It's not going to have as good of a motor or something yeah. that costs more than a thousand dollars. But if you're just starting out, that machine will last you forever. Ever. And when you do upgrade, now you've got a travel machine because yeah. it only costs 12 pounds. Like that is the easiest sale for me. And then Janome just came out with this new Sewist line. I love their Ooh. 780. It's, it looks prettier. It's a better Yeah, and that's machine. something they should be focusing on is the way people yes. are really into aesthetics. And that is yes. very underrated. They, and also for, for male sewer, for any yeah. males who are into sewing, what guy is going to want a machine? Again, I love Hello Purple Kitty. Machine. You love Hello Kitty. <laughs> but a guy starting to sew might not want the machine with flowers or Hello Kitty on the front. And I think there's a lot more men that are going to pick up sewing or that have picked up sewing. Like my dad has decided that that's what he wants to do in his retirement. You know, I gave him a sewing machine and he's already made four king size quilts. Didn't oh start out with a baby. He started out with a king size quilt. But like, well, at he, least he has some connections. <laughs> yeah, but he wanted, he knew what he wanted to do. And that's the thing is like, you know, you, you, you see people and you're like, I don't want someone to think that a king size needs to be their first project because if it's not for you and it's not what you want, then, then don't do it. I don't recommend a king size quilt as your first project. But I think that like 
I would never tear somebody down that had that ambition. I might yeah. tell them. You might that, try to gently tell yeah. them to start with something, you know, it, a little yes. easier. I get it though. I'm a dive right in type of person, yeah. you know, like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see a lot of men that are coming into sewing and doing things. So, you know, it's, it's not, an, it's not an uncalled for thing. There's still, I think a lot of, um, sexism in the industry, you know, um, that it's a woman's type thing. And, and I think that's really disappointing, but, um, it, we can move past that, I think, as yeah. a society as a whole. Um, I have had uh, male employees working at quilt shops, and some women are not okay with that. And it's, I forget that there are, there yeah, are people There's still out people there out there that are uncomfortable. Yeah, I know you yeah. you talked about that a little bit, you know, and some people don't, didn't someone say they didn't feel like a man, man no. belonged at a quilt shop or something? To the man's face. Oh my gosh. Which is, uh, you know, guys have a filter. I mean, you, uh, it, it's just, it, it, what happens if you were in a Lowe's and someone would say that to a woman? Woman, Oh, it would be, it would be a viral news it story. That's on the story. news. But, you know, I, um, it, it still would not be okay either way, you know? And I think, you know, I've had men come to my big retreats, you know, one it was a son that came with his mother and I'm, we just like thought that was really cool. You know, like I, I hire male teachers to teach at my events because they're good at what they do. You know, I don't, I don't, there's women that are good at what they do. There's men that are good. There's younger teachers that are good at what they do. Yeah. And there's older teachers that are good at what they do. You know, um, you just have to accept that and want them to be a part of it too. Yeah. Well, Brenda, thank you so much for, for doing this with me. Yes. Uh, I'm so glad we talked. Plus, it kind of, at least maybe maybe this will help with our cabin fever. I don't know. <laughs> I but tell, so. us, tell us what's going on for the near future with Pink Castle Fabrics and the Stitchery. How can people, um, you know, what do you want people to do? Do you have something to uh, share? Any announcements? I know you're selling a lot of stuff online. Yes. So tell people where they should go. Well, if you want to learn to sew, go to pinkcastlefabrics.com and pick up some fabric. And if you need a sewing machine, you can always email me, Brenda at pinkcastlefabrics.com and I can steer you towards, you know, the right genome for you. Um, we are going to start veering away from our, you know, brick and mortar and doing more online. And I think that hopefully this will free me up. I, one of my passions is teaching people and doing business things. And I want to start, you know, doing more business training with people so that people in the industry can actually make money rather than just be perceived as making money. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot of that going on. The sort of fake it till you make a thing. I have to pretend that everything's okay. Yeah. And everything's great. And, and that's, that's misleading. You know, it's like social media versus reality kind of thing. Right. Yes. So let's, lastly, uh, what, what do you have to say to someone uh, who's in the industry or thinking about starting a sewing or quilting related business? Uh, what are three, maybe like three or so things you would tell them? Um, do your homework. I think like actually think about this, make a spreadsheet about how much your profit margin is and what you actually need to make for your overhead. Um, think about, do you want to do this full time? I think that's the second thing I would tell you, like, is this a career for you or is this a hobby for you? It is okay to have sewing as a hobby. You do not have to make this a career because someone told you you make beautiful quilts. Yeah. You are allowed to make beautiful quilts for fun. You don't even have to have someone to make them for. You can literally just do this for yourself. Um, and just know that it is not something that you're problem that you're going to be a billionaire on. You will not be Warren Buffett of quilting. <laughs> <laughs> Good takeaway. Yeah, there are very few Jenny Doan's Missouri Star Quilting Companies There's in the one. world. There's one. Well, Brenda, thank you so much. And guys watching, if you're looking for more Brenda and her husband, Jason, we actually did another conversation. Was it like a, it was about a year and yeah. a half ago. Uh, so that was a really good conversation. It involved Jason, and her husband. So I'm going to link that here so you can check out more of our conversation. Maybe we should do this again. I think yeah, this is I think fun. so. Maybe well, we're going to be cooped up for a little I while. I know. While we're on our social distancing, maybe we can do this to kind of, 
you know, give, give some, you know, just keep having these conversations. You know, I think this is great to talk to people of different perspectives. So thank you guys all so much for yeah. watching. And, uh, and Brenda, thank you so much. Thank you.